If our image of the thing we're most frightened of, the serial killer, is wrong, what's the real thing like? Underneath that tent, you've, you've made important discoveries. Did you say they did not include or could include uh, human remains? There's a possibility they could, could in, include human remains. In 1979, Peter Jay was a detective who was called in after a Dynarod man found human remains in a drain. Jay went to interview the occupant of the flat, a Scotsman called Dennis Nielsen. As soon as he opened the door, you, you could smell a sort of um, that, that uh, odour of, of decomposing flesh as soon as you got inside. Uh, and I said to him, your drains are blocked with human remains. And he said, oh my God, how awful. Uh, and I got a little closer to him and looked him straight in the eyes and said, don't mess me about, where's the rest of the body? And immediately he said, it's in plastic bags in the front room. And with that, we opened up the back room, uh, looked inside a couple of wardrobes, and there were several bags there, um, supermarket bags containing uh, remains. And are we talking about one body here or, or two, perhaps? And Nielsen said neither. He said it's 16, and it actually turned out to be 15 later, but he lost count. I, I guess you asked him why he did it. Did you get any kind of explanation that made sense? Well, he actually asked us why we thought he did it. It just seemed that he was desperate to have a relationship. I, I know at least on two occasions he had uh, victims. Um, he, he, he kept the victims sitting in chairs uh, at home. Um, and he used to come home from work. And I think he thought to himself, well, albeit the guy's dead, there's somebody to come home to. Mm. It was bizarre. So what was Nelson like as a person? You wouldn't look at him, him straight away and even feel that there was something peculiar about him to begin with. In the context of what he'd done, he, he was just worryingly normal. He, he just seemed like Mr. Average, because he is actually a complete and utter bore. So, however we glamorise it, the face of the serial killer is the face of a bore. But what about the other 20th century stereotype of the face of evil? The political leaders we hold responsible for massacres and genocide. Every few hours, another boatload of corpses is pulled up onto the beach at Dimu. I find it hard to describe adequately the horrible things that I've seen and heard. It's hard to imagine, in our continent and in our time, what kind of people could do this. It wasn't Stalin or Hitler or Karadzic who massacred the people of Rwanda or Bosnia or who herded Jews into cattle trucks. It was ordinary people, bakers and postmen and shopkeepers. One American historian has made a detailed study of what ordinary men can do, of how they can change so that they become capable of the most terrible acts of evil. The men of Reserve Police Battalion 101 were ordinary Germans. They weren't political. They weren't Nazis. In the spring of 1942, most of them had never harmed a soul. The average age of the men was 39 and a half years old. They were in that age group that was too young to have fought in World War I, but old enough that they had had their formative experiences before 1933. So these are not people who had been raised in Nazi schools, in Hitler Youth, and uh, from terms of social background, uh, many of them, in fact, the, the bulk of them, were unskilled uh, labor. So what exactly did the battalion do? Well, the battalion is sent from Germany to central Poland uh, in late June of 1942, uh, told that they were to round up all the Jews in this village, about 1,800, send uh, the younger male Jews away as work Jews for the slave labor camps, and that they were then on the spot to shoot all the men, women, children, old people, infants, uh, to leave no one behind. Many of these people had never fired a, you know, a human being in their life. They had not been in combat. These were middle-aged police far behind the lines. They arrive at the village uh, very early in the morning. No one has told the men yet. 
what they're going to do, and so the major must finally explain it. Uh, they get out of their trucks at the edge of the village. Uh, the men say still just barely turning light. Uh, they're formed in a semicircle around the major, and he gives them a short speech. Uh, he tells them uh, that uh, he has, they have a task to do, a terrible task, a task he never would have asked them to do on his own. The witnesses say there were tears streaming down his cheeks. His body was shaking. He was fighting to control his voice, which was breaking. And then he went on to say what they were going to do. They were going to bring the Jews to the town center, uh, and then they would be put on trucks and taken to the woods uh, and executed. And at the very end of the speech, he says that any of you who do not feel up to it, please step out. And there's a long pause, and then he, somebody does step out. One of the young SS captains in the battalion begins to berate the man as a coward, and that how dare he. And the major cuts him off, takes the man under his protection, so the rest can see, and about a dozen men then step out. Out of 500 men, 12, 10 to 12, take up his offer not to shoot. They then round up the Jews in the village. Uh, that one company is sent to the woods to form the firing squad. Uh, the descriptions of, of the men of what took place in the forest are among the most horrific things I have read in, in now 30 years of doing research on the Holocaust. Thereafter, the job of the battalion is to either go to villages that are too far from the train stations, in which case they shoot everybody, or at the towns that are bigger and closer to trains, there they round up Jews, drive them to the train station, drive them onto the trains, pack the train cars as full as they can possibly get them, nail the doors shut, and ship them to Treblinka, which is about a 50 or 60 mile ride away. So these ordinary men, how did they justify these acts to themselves? You get a mixed bag. Uh, some uh, will say, well, I didn't want to appear weak in the eyes of my comrades. I didn't want to look like the weakling that couldn't hold. And they will talk about peer pressure. Others will say, you know, the spirit of the times, I didn't know better. And they're surprised and bewildered to be in the dock, uh, to be accused and to be standing trial and be held accountable for this. Uh, because they don't feel guilty. Uh, they feel that they have suffered bad luck. They had the bad luck, uh, misfortune, of being assigned to that battalion. That battalion had the misfortune to be assigned that task. Uh, and insofar as they feel pity, it is self-pity. It is not pity for the victims. The victims are almost off their screen. Uh, but there is a great deal of wallowing in self-pity that look what they had to suffer because they had to be assigned this duty and they had to carry this out. Do you think of um, the men who took part in these atrocities and during the, the Holocaust as being evil? And what we see, in fact, over a period of time is their transformation. Uh, that at the first massacre, uh, many of the men were quite traumatized, quite distraught by what they had been made to do, or what, what they had been asked to do and had complied. Uh, over a period of time, there emerges within the battalion a real hard core of people who learn to enjoy killing that volunteer for the task, that come home and joke about it over their meal, uh, that, that basically become totally corrupted by the experience uh, and the sense to become what they do. Not all of them do. I mean, there is human choice. We don't want to get the idea that this is simply deterministic. In fact, there is a group within the battalion that does not shoot, evades the shooting, uh, and that it shows that even under those circumstances, Human responsibility remains, human choice remains, uh, but that we can predict that given certain circumstances, uh, governments will find enough people to carry out government legitimized crime, even if everyone does not. Uh, and it is the carrying out of that that, in a sense, makes these people evil. <laughs>